I'm starting out with this advertising. It's kind of unique. It's larger than this. I just cut it down. Your future, our school. And we've all been there, staring into space, figuring out what we're going to do in life. But it tells you about Bowman Technical School. Watch making, engraving, and jewelry work right here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I broke the talk down into three, instead of just shooting a bunch of pictures at you, it's kind of like a three-part series. Uh, the Bowman legacy, more about the Bowman family and the, um, what they did, I mean, their contribution to Lancaster. The school, the part that I went to, and then Bowman Corner, mostly about the building, because it is a historical building called Bowman Quarter, Corner. Well, we'll start out with who started the whole thing. Ezef Bowman, a pioneer in horological education, founder, founder of the Bowman Technical School, born in 1847, died in 1901 at 54 years old, young. Um, he had to kind of a different kind of education. His father did not want him to go the regular route of apprenticeship, six years, too long, he arranged for a European master watchmaker to teach him in two years, for two years of service. And this probably had some kind of uh, involvement in Ezra F. Bowman's school, which he opened, because it was different than other educational means at that time. I mean, you went to college, you had colleges, which you go there and study. But trade schools, and I think Bowman's has the license number one trade school license, number one in Pennsylvania. That's what I heard, but I couldn't find anything about it. So after his apprenticeship, he worked for a jewelry store and then he worked for Adams and Perry and you saw about Adams and Perry. And he, after Adams and Perry went belly up, he, de he declined, well, there was no money and that was okay with him. He declined that he get paid. He just walked away from it he said he attributed to it and wish it would have worked out, but it didn't. And there's not many photos of him. I mean, there's this one, the other one on the next slide. But his, his daughter, Martha, was an artist. And this is probably like the most famous photo you see of Everest at Bowman. He had five children, and we know about Martha and John and, <laughs> well, I'll get to that. Charlie, yeah, but I'm not sure about the other two children. Um, this is right down here, 106 East King. I've, you know, I walked by this when I was in school and never knew it. A lot of people didn't know it. Um, the building is still there. I'll see, you'll see on the next picture of it. But this is a picture of him in 1877 with his staff. And that's a pretty big staff for 1877, watching clockmakers. Bowman watches and clocks, uh, I forget what it says there. But Bowman is the one standing in the doorway. And they have the, the uh, names of the other people there too, the other ones. Um, I was in this store yesterday. I'll show you a photo of it. So we were sitting right between the two buildings, right between 106 East King and Bowman Corner. This is actually right in the middle of the till. There's a building today. It's a thrift boutique. Met this woman yesterday. She's really nice. She's really intrigued about the history of it. Uh, if you can see from the photos, it's the same slab down there. And there, well, with the larger photo, you can see like some of the top molding there. And she had no clue that Bowman's was in there. I'm going to send her some pictures. She was, she was out, like, I showed her a picture that last picture and she was out there looking look this is the same and everything but she runs a really nice store very friendly if you ever get down there stop in so bowman ezra bowman was so busy with so many watches and clocks ordering so many parts and tools he became a wholesaler or jobber himself so he was able to buy tools market them and parts with his names on, with his name on, um, you know. And I, use, I actually use these calibers. These are really nice pair of truing calibers. But you'll see a lot. You'll see Bowman made a lot of stuff, in tools, including which is up in the left-hand corner, 
They're mainsprings for 16 size Elgin, 817. We go through those like crazy. That's probably why that's still left. But he started the tool company with his, with his brother-in-law. It lasted, his brother stuck in for, for uh, the brother-in-law stuck in for a while, and then his brother-in-law bailed out, and Everest continued to do the um, sale of the uh, parts and tools. <clears throat> Here's probably like one of the most famous tools. The engravers, the EFB engravers, came in a little kit. The one on the left is, or, is uh, original. All the engravers use these. When the students started, they got a kit. Um, and then on the right, I just took this out of a catalog. If you see EFB gravers, it's basically the same thing, and they still had the patent, the patent name on them. And at the top, you can just buy one graver handle. But it's a unique graver because you, that it's a sleeve on there. You can pull it out, put the other graver in, and use the rosewood handles. And then he, then he attempted to make a watch, which um, didn't go, go over too good. Started making watches in 1879. He employed William Todd as a supervisor for his watch manufacturing. Uh, he manufactured 50 watches. He got his equipment from the United States Watch Company, which if you look in the book, they went out of business in like 1877. And then he sold his watch making equipment to J.P. Stevens, which they started in, well, he only lasted a couple years, I think 1883. So it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of unique that they like were passing this equipment around and everybody was taking their shot at trying to be successful. Uh, basically a 16 size watch, free sprung, no, but no uh, regulator, plate layout, well I'll show you on the next slide, the plate layout's pretty close to the uh, Adizaparian. Um, but an important thing is, I mean, a kind of interesting note is years later, Mr. Todd introduced Hamilton to adopt Allen Bar, and we all know what that did to Hamilton. I mean, that, that, that other watch companies were here, Hamilton with the Allen Bar were here with the May Springs and the Hair Springs. A little comparison on the watches. On the oh, bottom right is an Amazon pair. You can see kind of the layout. Now, um, as it worked there, I don't know if Mr. Todd had any influence on, on uh, that. But then if you go up to the next one, this is a Bowman watch. Kind of like the same plate layout. And if you go over to the Stevens up on the left corner, I mean, the plate, lay, the plate layout is pretty close, except the, the escape wheel is under the top bridge. If you can look at Bowman's on the right, the escapement is escapement and pallet have a separate bridge. And supposedly he, I mean, uh, as are Bowman's watches, he did not make the balance or the powder escape with. They were, I think Roland said they were imported from England. But he made a nice watch. The only trouble was it was too expensive compared to the other watches of the day. Well, he was getting like 185 and I think the last speaker said, you know, you could buy a, a uh, Lancaster watch for 90. So it's like double the price. And then, Ezra died in 1901, and his two sons who had went, went through the course, Charles and John Bowman, Charles, 1880 to 1963, John Bowman, 1879 to 1959, and the, these two brothers, his sons, were 21 and 20, well, like 23 at the time he, he died. Now, they were still down in the other building. And they took over, as you can see, uh, Charles was a register, more like ran the place, and John Bowman was a director. And he, uh, as Charles probably ran administration, John Bowman probably ran the whole thing as director. But you gotta give these two guys a lot of credit. And in their early 20s, taking over a business like that and what they did with it, I mean, Ezra's would be very proud and supposedly John Bowman, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk to Rory before I did this. He has number one membership. He was number one 
membership in the NAWCC. I hope they heard they sold number three the other night. Well, oh, number eight. And that bought like 8,000. I don't know what number one would <laughs> bring. But I don't know how the membership work. We'll have to ask Rory about that. And then they were, John and Charles worked up till their death. Or worked, I mean, ran the school, the store, up to their death in the 60s. And uh, through two World War II's, Ran the the school and the store, and here were the new owners in 1966, 1963. And did anybody here know the Parkhurst through the through the association? Besides, yeah. Mr. Parkhurst, he was uh, I have a bio of him, but supposedly he came to Lancaster through the NAWCC toward Bowman's, and uh, because of the timing with them passing away, bought the school and the store because uh, they had both passed away. I don't think their sons wanted to take it over or their family wanted to take it over. But that's Mr. and Mrs. Parkhurst. Here's a new owner of the building, Ryan Miller. And I'm going to introduce him at the end because there's a lot of buzz going on in this building and he's doing a really good job. And uh, you know, when it went up for sale, everyone was talking about what's going to happen to it. It sat empty for 30 years, and he's a new owner. Did everybody get a chance to go up and see it? Yeah. 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 If you didn't, go up and check it out because uh, they're moving fast, and they really did a nice job. I was there yesterday. It was very impressive. So that's a little bit of you understand about the history of the uh, Bowman family. This is a school, a little history about the school and my experience there. This is the best part. <laughs> so they taught three things. When, um, they taught watchmaking, engraving, and jewelry repair. This is just an old postcard. I'm not sure when. It looks like from the 1920s. You can see on the left the uh, jewelry department up top on the left. Down below is, is the third, that's on the second floor. On the third floor, which is obvious by the layout, it was the watchmakers or watch school. And on the right was the engraving, which was also down on the second floor. And then there was a lecture room on the right top. That was on the second floor too, in the front of the building. And they were very, very, very active. Bowman Technical School was very active in a lot of things. Across the top, they accepted, this was in 1918, right after World War I, because they must have figured out that they didn't have enough help to repair um, instruments. So 216 men from the U.S. government were accepted by Bowman's for training. Now, they couldn't have trained them at that school. They were up here by then. But I think that picture was taken. There's a, I reduced that photo, but I think that photo was taken over at F and M. And then they had a basketball team on the left, a football, football on oh no, the ba a baseball team in the middle. They had a fraternity, basketball team, a football team, and a baseball team with some pretty nice jerseys. On the one on the right here. So it was, it was a boom in school. Here's what it cost when I, when I went there. It was like jewelry engraving. One, it was started, when, I, when I started, it was 115, and then I was only there a couple months. Went up to 125 a month. So yeah, it seems like when you look back at it, it seems like it was like really a good bargain. Uh, well, in today's standards, it's like a, a no-brainer, but... Um, you know, for $1,500 a month, I mean, that's like one watch repair today, right? <laughs> Some people. <laughs> uh, here's a, here's a uh, photo from one of the booklets. They put out nice booklets, and I do have a display back there with two of the clocks that were made and some other stuff in these booklets. Please don't touch the clocks. The other stuff you can touch. Um, this is the third floor. 
looking toward the back of the building from the booklet in 1953. Yeah, nice, the building was built with nice big windows, a lot of light, roomy, spacious, um, and uh, so I applied 1977. There was a waiting list. Uh, I think I think the waiting list was nine months. I got accepted in like six months. I mean, I got accepted, and then my name came up in six months. I started there. I think in November. What's on the next slide? November of 1977. I started in the watchmaking course, and here's what I walked into. That's the same floor. November 14, 1977. And if you look at the photo, they put benches right down the middle. The place was packed. The watchmakers were up toward the front of the building. This is taken from the back to the front. The uh, they had benches through the center. They had engravers up there, jewelry uh, people who started a jewelry course, and this whole section in the front of the photo, which is in the back of the building, was a clock shop. Now, Mr. Parker's added the clock shop in 19, I have, I think, 72. Um, so up to then, up to when Mr. Parker's was, I bought the school with Mr. and Mrs. Parker's, it was just jewelry, watch, and clock, and then Mr. Parker's introduced the clock course. But this was my first day, and I'm actually sitting, I don't think it's here. I'm sitting right here. I just got my tool bag. I was categorizing my tool bag, and I had no idea that the the, uh, the newspaper, the press, was in to take photos. And the reason they were taking photos is because it was the 100th anniversary of the uh, Bowman Technical School, but not necessarily because Ezra started a watch and clock repair, did the tools, and the school started later, like. Ten, they think like around 1885. They're not sure when the school started, but it did not start in 1877. Um, so I, I don't even remember this photo being taken. I mean, I was so nervous. I walked into this. I didn't know anyone. I just sat there. Oh, well, you can see I'm all bent over. Just paying attention and marking my tools in. And then Mr. Harry gave me my uh, files and said, go put these files on these handles. And then I filed for like, he said, I'll see you three months later. <laughs> There's what it looks like today. You didn't get to go up to the third floor, but I did get to go through it a couple months ago after when it was up for sale. So where I'm standing there is where I was sitting in that other photo, but the photo's taken on the opposite direction. And uh, Mr. Miller will tell us more about, the, about this. There were the three instructors that were there at my t when I was there. Um, did you have Mr. Harry? Yeah, Mr. Harry's on the right. He taught the beginning of the watch course. Bob Cena in the center. He finished up the watch course, hair springs and finals. He also taught a jewelry repair. And then on the left was Coach Pashadi. He taught the clock course. And, uh, and let's see, that's what it, yeah, they were the three instructors. And then Mr. Parker, as I said, taught the clock course. He was an interesting man. He was born in 1912. He owned a park manufacturing out in Ohio with patents. I think some of those patents are still good today. He, he was into hydraulic and brakes. In 1969, his wife, Jeannie, died in an airplane, airplane crash. She was a pilot. She died down here in Virginia in a private plane. Um, he had taken over the school with her. In 1970, he married Melanie. That was the one in the photo. 1972, he started a clock course, clock making course. He died in 1970, I mean, died in 1991 at age 79. He was actually buried with his first wife he always had a suit and tie on, very nice man, very uh, 
down to earth. He, his hobby was RC planes. And he, he really was into this clock course. He loved, he loved the students making them. He was always there teaching us about them. And uh, he, he was just, he, when your heart was into making the clock part of the course, he was there, uh, he was a big influence on being a part of, uh, of the education of the clock course. There's a clock we made. Uh, when you took the clock, I took the watch course and I took the clock course. And the reason I took the clock course is because I wanted to make the clock. Mm -hmm. And then I took the jewelry course. And here's the straight time only regulator movement that we made. Um, this was probably like my best part of bonus. In the, in the watch course, we made a lot of tools and made a pivot polish and stuff. In the, uh, Clock course, you made a, you were the option to make a clock. You didn't have to. And jewelry, you made finals. You made a bunch of jewelry, and then in the engravers, you made a plate, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Here's a list of all the clock makers. I mean, the, all the students that made clocks, including Mr. Parkhurst. He he made a couple in here, some experimental experimental models, like that one on the left back there is made with rolling rolling ball bearings. It's the number 16. It's a model four. Uh, did you make a clock? Oh, yeah. Oh, you were early. Yeah. 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 I talked to you at the, at the show, last show. Yeah. Uh, well, I actually got it off of another student who got it off of Mrs. Parkhurst. Yeah, I'll see you get one. Did I? Yeah, I gave one to Bob, didn't I? Yeah. But um, I never knew this list existed until a couple of years ago. I got off Warren Malcolm, who was a student there, who actually didn't make clocks, but he knew Mrs. Parker. So he goes, you know, I have a list of all, this, all the people that made a clock, clocks at uh, Bowman's. It was really rough. I redid it so you could actually read it. Um, some of the interesting things, Mark Mitchell, does anybody know him? He was at the show. He made a grasshopper escapement. Uh, he said he wanted to do that. Mr. Parker said, I don't know anything about it. You're on your own. And then after he was done, Mr. Parker wanted the drawings for it, and Mark wouldn't give them to him, or something like that. And I wanted to talk to Mark about it yesterday, but I didn't hear it. I mean, I heard if they asked him. Uh, this was really a great course, because you were made, it wasn't one class. You stepped in on your own and you made them, and the people that made them before you helped you, and you helped the people behind you make them, and Mr. Parker was just sitting there. But it was a great course. This is the engraver's plate of what the engravers, the final plate, these are like pieces of art. Um, you know, this is a friend of mine who I took a photo, uh, he, he posted this on Facebook. But they're really done well, and they're like pieces, like I said, they're pieces of art. It's kind of neat how you do each of the lettering according to what it is, like round block, everything like that. Um, 1992, the school closes, and uh, by that time we had moved from this building up here to the new building down Pet Boys. We've been there since 1978. Um, and to back up a little, we were in this building. I mean, I started in this building in 1977, and I was only there nine months. Something happened with veterans coming to the school and safety and no elevators that the state came in and Mr. Parker's bought the building down here on King Street. It used to be a pet boys that went out of business. It's at the end of the gully, down at the bottom of the gully. And everything, all the jewelers, watchmakers, engravers, clock department were all moved down there. And it was, you know, the old building was nice, but a jeweler could have been on the second floor work, uh, taking the course, a watchmaker on the third floor. You never met. We're done at the Pet Boys building. We were all on one floor and everybody knew each other. Um, yeah, I, I, the, the, the Bowman building, 
I, I don't know how that never burnt down because the, st the jewelers, their torches were running all the time. We were up on the third floor with alcohol cups, removing pallet stones, and next thing you know, the floor was on fire. Um, the clockmakers were back in the back, hardening and tempering with a big torch, and uh, it, there was a lot of fire going on in that building. But um, some girl leaned up against another jeweler, and half her hair was burnt off, and she had to shave her head. I mean, there was always stuff going on up at that old school. I liked the old school. It really had character. <laughs> Here's a photo on the left of a graduating watchmaker from Bowman's, a graduating class. On the right is my class. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just talking about people who wore ties all the time because somebody said, oh my gosh, you're wearing a tie. I was like, yeah, you know, besides funerals and talks at the uh, symposium, that's where you wear a tie. <laughs> but um, it was, at Bowman's, it was a very, very close-knit student body. Everybody looked out for each other. Everyone got along. I, well, if you didn't get along, I saw some girl straighten some guy out one day. Um, some guy was picking on another guy, and, some, and one of the students jumped up, and she took care of that. But the thing about Bowman's is um, you build a relationship with these other students, and you have a lifetime friendship because you're, you're um, the one, no matter if you took watch or clock or jewelry, you have something in common the rest of your life. And I just had two of my friends I went to Bowman stay with me this weekend, Mark Pellman and um, Greg Doom. And my mouth, I could already talk now, because we talked for like three days straight. <laughs> and Greg kept me up every night to like 12.30, you know, talking about Bowman's and watches and clocks. You have something in common with these people. And back to that clock list, I got a call from Chris. Did you know Chris up in New England? He was pretty close to making your clock. And we were on the phone for like a half hour. He wanted to drive down for this. I thought, I wouldn't drive the whole way down from Massachusetts for this. I mean, maybe the whole thing, but not just me. I said, you can see it, you know, on uh, if they recorded or something. But um, it, was, it, was, it was nice. And at Bowman's, I wanted to back up and tell you about the curriculum, because they had a really good curriculum. You started on your own, and you had your curriculum, and you didn't go to the next part until you finished that part. So it wasn't like a class where you were holding the class up or you were done waiting for the rest of the class. It was, it was laying out a really good curriculum and supposedly the curriculum for the watch course I'm talking about. And the jewelry and engraving course were the same. But supposedly the watch course was the same course that they started with, which I, I imagine it was pretty close to it because we were working on some, well, I wouldn't say it like that, but we, we, we worked on a lot of stuff. I mean, did a lot of stuff, made a lot of tools and everything like that. But supposedly the curriculum never changed for 100 years. Uh, now, uh, the final part about the building, I'm running out of time here. Uh, here's from a booklet, 1936. Um, you know, the, the building's kind of plain. Has, the, of course, the observatory on top. If you notice, no clocks in the corner. The clock was not installed yet. Antennas on the roof, which weren't for TV, they were to probably pick up a signal for correct time. Uh, the building was built in 1912, took years to, two years to make. The observatory, uh, in 1912, 1914, you don't need an observatory to get correct time. So is that was what was made for? You know, you, you could have got it from, um, I can't think who it was from, but I don't know if that was a, hobby of his, of John and Charles, because Ezra's was already going, he had nothing to do with this building. But, I mean, who doesn't want an observatory on top of their building, you know? <laughs> but I imagine the uh, antennas picked up the signal for the correct time. Uh, let me see what else about the building. No sign on the side. Here's, a, here's from a postcard in 1943. Uh, a couple years later, a sign on the side, still no, still no clock in the corner. Uh, and ten, this isn't that, that far away from the last one. Uh, you can see Bowman's above the door. 
Here's 1952, uh, a lot of changes. Tan antennas are going Bowman across the side. The streetcocks were added, which was, you know, probably John's idea, somewhere between 1943 and 1952. Um, marquee on the side, huge marquee. That's a straight thing going up and down. Uh, and I think it was painted white because I think when Mr. Parker's bought it, I think he removed all the white because this, and there's a photo of it. This is out of the book. And I also came across another photo and that building is white. 1975, this, um, let me see what's different. Well, this, the street is pretty much the same. It's a different angle of it, but the white is gone. And this is after Mr. Parkhurst bought it, and supposedly he did uh, restoration work on the building. It imagines that he, re he uh, restored the building. So I imagine he took the white paint off. I don't know if there's any resonance of the, the white paint on the outside or, or not. This is 1977. This was a same newspaper article that I was in. The marquee's gone. That's Mrs. Parkhurst, so he said, about 100 years in Lancaster. Um, Bohm is still on the side. Uh, observatory, of course. This is current. This was just in the spring this year. This, this wasn't taken by me, but it was taken by somebody else. Nice shot of the building. This is down the jewelry store. I don't have any. I don't have any more photos of the jewelry store because you all. I knew you were all going to go see it, but it pretty much looks the same as it did now. The showcases are in the same place. They really cleaned them up nice. Uh, this is you know, the famous. You know the uh, safe is in the wall, uh, uh, the clock, and I noticed that little guy shooting the arrow is missing. So I don't know if they still have it or not, but anybody that went down there, you know where this section is there. That's Mrs. Parker. She was doing some advertising for the newspaper. Uh, does anybody remember this guy? <laughs> yeah. Victor Stoltz. He ran the jewelry store when I was there. And Victor took a lot of credit for running the school, which I never saw Victor. But I knew who Victor Stoltz was because my father used to go to Rainers. I used to go with him. And he, he was always at Rainers every Sunday morning. So like I was there like at the school for like almost a year. We ran into Victor Stoltz and my father says, oh, you know, Jim, my son, he's, a, he's taking the watch course. And Victor says, I don't know him. <laughs> but he signed all the, pl the diplomas and everything. So v Victor, they had to have so many people on the board. But Victor was a great guy. But he ran the store, the jewelry store on the first floor. And you know we were kind of, we really didn't go in there too much because they sent me down for a part one time and they're like, what do you want? <laughs> you know, get back up there and practice watches. Quit bothering us. Uh, this is part of the part of the building when I went there. It was that little on the second floor in the front. If you're looking at the front of the building, it was that left window, uh, window on the right. Supposedly, you know, the story was that this was John Bowman. I mean, Ezra Bowman's shop to make watches, but there's not enough equipment there to make a watch. I mean, there's some, there's some that lay there with the index where you can make a wheel. But this, this little, it was kind of, we call it like a little museum or a shrine. It was really interesting because they had this equipment from 100 years ago on display. And in 92, they had an auction, but I don't remember them auctioning any of these items off, but they had the jack shaft on the right. Uh, but not, I mean, uh, microscope to look at watches, which, you know, and in the middle is some kind of gearing for the lathe. And of course, the iconic street clock, which is being restored right now, uh, that ran the whole time I went to school and the whole time I was in Lancaster. But we were talking yesterday about that. Bob, is that a Seth Thomas or a Howard? It's a Seth Thomas. Has a Bowman plate on the front, but that was engraved, you know, the Bowman clock. Yeah, that's a nice piece. And of course, the iconic uh, observatory. And uh, what if, in doing my reading and stuff, I found out that there was a faint, there was a very well-known astronomer, John Alfred Brush here. 
1920, an instrument builder, and he made the telescope for inside the observatory. And he has telescopes in like universities and stuff, very well known uh, maker. If you, you go it, he has his own like Wikipedia page, tells all about him. I'm not gonna go into all that. But I was talking to Ryan on the phone, new owner, and he said, where's the telescope? I said, no, he asked me, where's the telescope? And I'm gonna make this quick. Mr. Parkhurst would pull us in the lecture room every once in a while, I'd give talks. We talked about shooting the stars or something. I said, where's the, where's the telescope for up in the observatory? He goes, it's up in the basement underneath the store. You want to see it? We were down at the new building by then. I said, yeah. He goes, meet me up there at 1230. So a bunch of us students went out for lunch and met him there. He took us down to the basement. And there in the basement in a wooden crate with like that old straw was this huge brass telescope. And I want to talk to somebody that went with me because I remember it as being like this round. It was one of the reflector ones, I think, where you look in the side. It was like six feet long. It was very impressive looking. But Ryan had asked me what happened to the telescope. And I said, last time I saw it was in the basement. I was at the sale in 92 when they had two auctioneers going off, one on the second floor, one on the first floor. That telescope was not sold there. Uh, a friend of mine, I was telling him the story. He, he claims he saw it at Black Angus in 2016. And I was just talking to him and he goes, I know what booth it is. So he's on the case. He went there this morning to find out if the guy knows where the telescope went. He thinks that's, after I described it to him, he thinks that telescope that I described was the one that was at Rainer's for sale. I mean, at Black Angus for sale. So we're on the case. It's kind of like Indiana Jones, you know, you should make a movie out of this. Uh, I'm ending it with this. Um, I talked about Mr. Parker's, uh, Melanie Parker's, his second, uh, uh, Mr. Parker's second wife. Uh, she, the reason I'm finishing with this is she had a big influence on the school while I was there. You know, um, she just passed away last year, 96 years old. She was first married in 1944 to Private John Pappas, who died in World War II. So she could not have been married too long to him because the war ended in 1945. Uh, she had one son. And the strange thing in life is you, don't, you think you know someone, and then you read their obituary, and you're like, I didn't know that. You know, she was a GIA graduate, owned a 1934 Auburn, which is an antique car, and she restored she liked restoring antique historic homes in the, down on the eastern shore. And her bio goes on and on. I just put like the key, like the key parts of it. But she was very involved in a lot of stuff. Um, she, well, she ran a tough, uh, well, she was kind of, I don't know how to explain it. I admire her now. Back then I thought she was a little, you know, she's a little tough on the students, but you're dealing with a hundred kids, you know, with our hormones going crazy and then trying to learn and stuff. But you got to give her a lot of credit for running the uh, school as long as it did. What happened to the school? I don't know. You know, Bob was there at the end. You know, the uh, attendance was way down, wasn't it? You know, when I went, I had to wait, you know, a year or well, 13 years earlier, I had to wait to get in. Bob, you know, you probably went right in, didn't you? Yeah. Um, I'm going to introduce Ryan, uh, Mr. Miller, Ryan Miller, Brent L. Miller. He's going to talk about the billion a little, and then I just got somebody to thank then. Hi, I'm Ryan Miller from Brent Miller Jewelers. That's a retail uh, jewelry store and watch store here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. My dad moved to Lancaster in 1972 from Arlington, Virginia to attend the Bowman Technical School. So I grew up hearing stories about the school and um, I have no memories of it being open. It closed in 1992 and just walking by over the years, I was always fascinated with it. And you couldn't really see in, you know, the, the, the floor is kind of raised and the cases are, are raised. You couldn't see in. So um, 
over, over my career, we've become more interested in shining a light on the history of watchmaking, Hamilton, uh, what Roland does, um, the Watch and Clock Museum, and Bowman's a big piece of that, and we you know, decided to, to buy it, and uh, we want to preserve it. We're really excited to partner with Hamilton on the first floor, and we want to uh, preserve uh, the, the second and third floor and do something that, that both uh, celebrates the history but also looks forward, so we're still developing the plan. Uh, uh, and we, we do want to find that telescope, so uh, yeah. let, let us know if, if, if you know. So thank you so much, and thank you, Jim. This has been great. He, he, he deserves a big round of applause. Yeah, thank you so much. And your father would be proud. Um, let me finish up here. I'd like to thank the library, the NAWCC, James Gibbs. He wrote, he wrote a great book on Pennsylvania watch and clock making. Um, good information on that book, especially about Bowman's. Lancaster History, the History Center. Uh, when the school closed, apparently Melanie, Mrs. Parker, gave everything there. There's like 16 boxes and files after files after files. A couple, a couple photos, not too many photos. But if you want, if your great grandfather graduated from Bowman's, it's probably in there because I was going through all the files trying to just pull stuff out I wanted. And they have graduating classes uh, from like 1933 or whatever. Um, and also, when we went to Bowman's, we had to sign in when we started. And I think signed out when we, when we left or finished a course. And th all those books are there too. Uh, so much stuff. Like um, it'd be something you'd want to do when you retire, I would imagine. Um, we have a Facebook page, Bowman Technical School, whoever's on Facebook. If you want to see good photos of what's happening to the school, to the uh, building with Brent, uh, Brent Miller. And uh, they're, they're posting a lot of pictures on a lot of old photos of the students and stuff. Um, it's private. It's a private Facebook page, but you can join and put photos and anything on that you want related to Bowman School, store, whatever. Uh, thanks for having me.